We've been in a current series called The Drama of Redemption in which we've been tracking Christ's person and works. And so far we looked at redemption accomplished. And in the past few weeks we've been looking at how redemption has been applied. We have plumbed the depths of three great truths. The first being God choosing his people. We saw how God from eternity past chose his people for his own glory and your joy. A matter of fact, Ephesians 1, 6 says that God did all of this for the praise of his glorious grace. Secondly, we looked at the great topic of the called. We looked at how God called people to himself out of darkness into his marvelous light. We saw how God changed their hearts. And I don't want you to get the wrong impression about God bringing people to himself. God never forces one to come to him. God simply opens your eyes that you may behold his beauty and see his majesty. And when you see it, you fall in love with him and you willingly come to him. This is what Psalm 110 10 verse 3 says. In the day of his power, God's people are made willing. And we found out that those whom God has called, he has justified. Last week, Chris talked about how God justifies us through the sacrifice of Christ. God makes us right before his law. And now we can stand before him without guilt or inferiority. And these are the three great truths that we have covered thus far. However, today we want to talk about the great truth of adoption. The doctrine of adoption reveals to us how God has fundamentally changed our relationship with God from one of hostility to one of love and peace. In order to help us understand this great truth of adoption, I'd like to offer up a few introductory thoughts about this topic. First, I want to give you a concise definition of this doctrine called adoption. Wayne Grudem helps us here. He says this, quote, Adoption is an action of God whereby he makes us members of his family, unquote. Adoption, as the term clearly implies, shows us that we have been transferred from one kingdom to another, one family into another family. Paul doesn't mention this in the book of Colossians, but he kind of alludes to this fact about this transfer that has taken place. Matter of fact, he talks about this tra transfer in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. He says, he has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of of his beloved son. So in adoption, God transfers us from one family to another. Now we must not confuse adoption with the theology or the doctrine of regeneration. Although adoption and regeneration are closely linked, they deal with two distinct problems. Adoption deals with our relationship to God. Regeneration deals with our nature. In regeneration, the Holy Spirit builds a house for himself. In adoption, he dwells in the house. Regeneration engraves upon us the likeness of the Father. Adoption relates us to God as our Father. In regeneration, he makes us partakers of his divine nature. In adoption, he makes us partakers of God's fatherly affections. We must realize that adoption is not justification. Justification is the fundamental blessing of the gospel, and it meets our most basic need, which is forgiveness and reconciliation to God. Without justification, there is no adoption. However, God, through God, adoption is the richer blessing because it brings us from heaven's courtroom into the family room of God. Justification deals with God as our judge, our just judge. Adoption allows the judge to become our father. Last one, adoption is in sanctification. Thomas Brooks says this, quote, Sanctification is simply a living out of one's adoption and sonship. Sanctification deals with our ongoing conformity to Christ. Adoption deals with our immutable position in Christ. It makes us Christ's brother, and it establishes God as our eternal Father, if I could sum it up in one definition, I would say this. Re adoption is an act of God's free grace whereby we are received into his family and have the rights and privileges of a son. So 
So we can see here that adoption is a very important truth. It is a very important point of theology, one that we must meditate upon, one that we must grasp and reflect upon often. It is not a new truth. It is something that has been peppered throughout the Old Testament. God adopted Israel. He did not adopt them because they were great people or that they kept his law or that they were the most beautiful people. Deuteronomy chapter 8 tells us that he chose them and he adopted them because they were the least of all people. So this truth comes from the Old Testament into the New. And the Apostle Paul helps us understand the beauty and the glory of this doctrine or this truth called adoption in the book of Galatians, particularly chapter 4. And if you'd be so kind, I, would, I want to ask you to turn there because that's the text we'll be working with. Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Paul is going to help us grasp the wonderful truth of adoption here. We're going to read the first seven verses together. And it reads as so. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child is no different from his slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. In order to help us understand Paul's logic here, or why he needs to talk about adoption, I want us to understand something of the situation that surrounded the churches of Galatia. Paul established churches in the southern region of Galatia. And he nurtured them. He watched over them. He saw over their growth. And after a period of time, Paul left the churches of Galatia in the the regions of Galatia. After he left, the church was infiltrated by false teachers. Now, these teachers did not deny Christ. And oftentimes, when someone is a false teacher, they don't often deny Christ. But they add something to Christ. That's something to look out for even today. You see? So they added the law to Christ. They said, well, you can have Christ. You can have Jesus. You can love Jesus. But you must obey the law as well. And when Paul caught wind of this, he was furious. So he wrote this letter to the Galatian church. And he defends the truth of the gospel. And he defends his apostleship first. He defends the doctrine of the gospel. He defends the content of the gospel. He defends the origin of the gospel. And Paul goes into battle here. He fights for the gospel. He is so upset over this demise. He is so upset that he says this, that whoever comes to you and preaches another gospel to you, whether it be myself or an angel from heaven, let him be a curse. And Paul helps them understand the great truth of adoption by showing them the insufficiency of the law and the sufficiency of Christ in the gospel. Paul helps the Galatian church see this in three points. Number one, he shows them their need for adoption. We see this in Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Here he explains their hopeless condition. Number two, he explains to them the means of adoption, how they come into the family of God or how they have come into the family of God. And this is seen in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 5. Here he explains how God remedied their situation. And then lastly, he talks about the fruit of adoption. Found in Galatians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. Let's look at our first point together. 
the need of adoption, found in Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Here he describes their hopeless situation. Let's read it together once again. He says, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. But in the same way, we also, when we were children, were slaves to the elementary principles of the world. Here in these first three verses, Paul expresses to the Galatians church the the reason as to why they needed this truth of adoption. They needed to come into the family of God because they were slaves to the law. Notice here that Paul helps the Galatians church understand their slavery to the law by providing them with a helpful illustration. He uses the illustration of an immature child a child or a child before they come into maturity. And he says that that child, before they come to an age of maturity, they they are under guardians or tutors. The guardian was harsh often and oftentimes. The guardian told them how to dress. The guardian told them what to eat. The guardian told them what they had to study. The guardian had control over every aspect of their lives. And oftentimes the child would despise the guardian. And they would long for the day in which they would be freed from this guardian. And Paul is basically saying, notice here in verse 3, he says, In the same way, you were under a guardian. We have to ask Paul this question. What is the guardian or who is the guardian? Well, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 24, he says this. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. Paul is telling the Galatian church, he's saying, why would you want to be enslaved again? Don't you understand that the law only offers you slavery? He is trying to help them understand what God has done for them through this great truth of adoption. And he continues on his, with his argument from chapter 3 into chapter 4 showing them that they they were slaves to the law. Why would you want to go back? And in chapter 3, he says this, when you were slaves of the law or when you were under the guardianship of the law, you were lost. You were under sin. But when Christ came, you were made free from the law. And this is simply what Paul is saying to us in the first three verses of Galatians chapter 4. Now, how are we enslaved to the law? We must ask that question and we must answer that question. Number one, we are enslaved to its demands. The law demands that you keep it in all of its, in, in its entirety. The law does not la- allow for any breaking points. It does not give you a point or a break. It wants you to k- keep it in its entirety. Galatians 3.10 James 2.10 tells us that the law wants us to keep it in its entirety. A matter of fact, if you break one point of the law, it is an organic whole. It says if you break one point, you have broken it all. And this is something that no human being can do. Romans 3.23 says this, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the Bible defines sin for us. 1 John 3, 4. It says to sin is to transgress God's law. We are slaves to its demands. It wants us to keep it thoroughly. And this is something we cannot do. Secondly, we are enslaved to its scrutiny and its ability to expose sin. Romans 3.20 says this. Through the law comes The knowledge of sin. Notice it didn't say through the law comes redemption. It says through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Dear ones, the law is like a great detective. It goes to work to discover and gather all of the data surrounding your life. And it burrows deep. It looks at every thought. It goes down to the very thoughts and intents of your heart, your motives. And after it has found out all of your sin, it turns around to become a prosecuting attorney to condemn you before the judge of all of the earth. The law stands in the Supreme Court of Heaven. 
And it says, Lord, we have this person here that has broken your law. Have I not demanded that they should not commit adultery? Have I not commanded that they shall not murder? Did I not say they should not bow down to other gods? Yet this one God, day after day, month after month, week after week, they despise your law. They break your law. And they love to break your law. We as human beings, we stand up in all of our self-justifying powers, don't we? Hey, look. Hey, man, hold up here. Hold up. I've never committed adultery. I, I've never murdered anyone. You really? Are you crazy? I've never murdered anyone. I've never bowed down to any so-called gods. And the law stands up again. The great prosecuting attorney, he stands up and he says, Ah, certainly you have not committed adultery. You have not committed adultery physically, but when I open up your heart and I look down into the chambers of your heart, I see, sir, that you are an, adul an adulterer. Did not the scriptures say, if you look upon someone to lust after them in their hearts, you are an adulterer? No, you have not murdered anyone. You're not Jeffrey Dahmer, but you are a murderer at heart. You hate your brother, don't you? 1 John 3.15 says, whoever hates his brother is a murderer. You not only hate your brother, but you hate those of different ethnic groups. And you stand here, sirs, and say you aren't a murderer. You are a murderer. For your God-hating heart. The law says, certainly, you have never bowed to Buddha. You have never bowed to Shiva. You have never bowed to any god. But you desire that for which you cannot have. You covet. And the scriptures say in Colossians 3, 5, that if you covet, you have committed the sin of idolatry. And the law stands up and says, Lord, have I not presented this one before you in the jury of heaven and before all of the angels? Have I not pre presented this one as guilty before you? And you stand before the law broken. We're enslaved to its verdict. The law only deems human beings guilty. It has never lost the case for people who are self-justifying. You see, this is what the Galatian church has missed. This is why they thought, oh, you know what? I can have Christ plus the law. I can go ahead and get circumcised. I can keep the feast days and the festivals, and I can have Christ too. I can have my cake and eat it too. We do this as well, don't we? We look at the Galatians, oh, that, that's their problem. But we do this all the time, don't we? Let's take the stay-at-home mother. She may go around, hey, I homeschool. You homeschool? I, I, you don't homeschool? I homeschool. Somebody says, no, I don't homeschool. The stay-at-home mother, deep down in her mind, says, oh, you know, they, their kids are going to grow up to be, you know, the devil's uh, uh, seed. <laughs> but the moment you fail at homeschooling, what happens? You're guilty. Your conscience condemns you. Why? Because you've been trusting in something other than the gospel to justify you before God. And it is only what Christ has done for you that justifies you before God. What about when you sin? You know what? Sin today. I'm going to go and talk to Chris. I'm going to call him. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell him I'm going to serve in the children's ministry. That's what I'm going to do. Then I'm going to read my Bible 10 hours a day. Matter of fact, I'm going to go get the Robert Murray McShane Bible reading plan. That's what I'm going to do. And then I'm going to read my Bible every day of the week. And what happens when you sin again? You go through the same rat race. Because, see, you're trying to be justified by works, by law, and you're only justified by what Christ has done for you. We must remember this. We are enslaved to its curse. The law, Deuteronomy 28, 15 through 68, 
gives a grand indictment against those who break it. Only wrath and the curse, nothing good. This is what we have with the law, the curse. This is what Christ took for you on the cross, the curse. Your curse for breaking God's law. The law shows us that we are enslaved to sin. 1 Corinthians 15, 56 says, the power of sin is the law. Why? Why? Because the law is evil? No. The law is not evil. It's, Paul says in Romans 7 that it is holy, just, and good. It's just doing its job. But it, Paul says there was, there's something within us called sin that looks at God's good law, his law that he's given us to protect us, looks at it and goes to work to break it because we despise God and we despise his law. We are shown that we are to be children of wrath. We are shown to be people who desire the lust of our father, Satan, John 8, We are shown to be within the family of Satan, 1 John 3, 10. And it is because of who the Galatians were, because of who we were, that we needed to be free from the law as a means of justification. Let me help bring this truth home to you. Many of us in this church have adopted children. Some of you are thinking about adopting children. But those children, when you went through the process, when you brought them home, I don't know if it's true of everyone, but just, just a blanket statement, but most of the time, those children did not ball up their fists as soon as you brought them home to strike you, or before you even got them, before you ball up their fists and strike you. When you took them home, they didn't go to your kitchen and get a butcher knife and try to murder you. They didn't pull out a Smith & Wesson and try to shoot you. You see? But you see, the beauty of this doctrine of adoption is that this is what God has done. God has taken people who hate Him, who despise Him. Romans chapter 5 says that He took His enemies and He brings His enemies into His family. And He says that for those enemies, you know what He's going to do? After He regenerates them and justifies them and adopts them into His family, He's going to show forth or display the immeasurable riches of His grace to you from all eternity. Don't ask me after service what that means, because I don't know what that means. I, all I know is this, that it is something that is so grand, something that is so amazing, that if you did not probably have a new body, you would explode for the joy that you would have from seeing what God is going to do with his immeasurable grace on your behalf. And he does this for enemies. Would you do this? Be honest with yourself. Would you do this? None of us would. I'm, I'm speaking for all of us. None of us would. When we have enemies, we don't go and just invite them into our home. God has done this with this truth of adoption. This brings us to our second point, the means of adoption, found in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 5. Let's look at it here. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. In the first three verses, Paul tells us that you can't be a child of God, you can't be just with God by fulfilling the law. And here he gives us the answer as to how we can be made right with God 
how we can be made children of God, be adopted into the, his family, and it is through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Now, how did he do this? Let's be specific here. How does God do this? Let's look at it again. It says here in verse 4, he did it this way. But in the fullness of time, when the, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. Now stop there. Do you realize what he's talking about here? You know, I love to read the Bible. I love Bible reading plans. And I get stuck in this trap. Many of us do where I'm reading and I'm checking out. I, oh, okay, I read Romans 1, read Romans 2, read Romans 3, and just set the Bible down for the rest of the day. But have you sat down with the Bible after you have read it and meditated upon some of these great truths that God has within them? Have you dug deep to find the diamonds? This is a diamond here. Because God is showing us both the eternality of himself and his son. And it is from this eternal abode that God sent his son to die for you. Let me help you understand this a little bit more. Listen, long before God created matter out of nothing, long before he took that matter and he set it, upon his eternal workbench called wisdom. Long before he forged matter out to be what we call the universe. Long before he hung that dark abyss up and spoke into it, let there be light, resulting in millions and millions and billions of galaxies. Long before God sat down to name each star within those galaxies, Billions upon billions, long before he did that, long before the cherubim cried out to him in praise, in all of their incandescent glory, long before that, long before they shook the heavenly temple because of their thunderous praise, long before Adam took his first breath, long before God stopped and looked at his entire creation and said, it is good. Long before he did that, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit existed. They not only existed, but they existed in absolute love and fellowship. See, oftentimes we, for, we, we don't think about these truths enough. We think God, we deserve it. God, you know, God has to give this to me. God has, he just has to give, you know, he has to save me. You know, God created man because he needed a family. That's what people think sometimes. There's a book, not going to name it. It's an awful book. Don't buy it if you find it. If you read it, throw it in the trash. I'm not going to tell you what it is. But the book asserts that God needed a family. That's why he created. God needs nothing. God existed in absolute fellowship. The Father communed with the Son and the Spirit. The Spirit communed with the Son and the Father. And the Son communed with the Father and the Spirit. And it says that in their presence, Psalm 16, verse 11, in their presence is fullness of joy and pleasures evermore. Let me ask you another question. Would you leave? Something like that? I'm going to be honest with you. I wouldn't. That's what they had together. And it is from this context that God sent his son. God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son. And the son desired to see you redeemed. That he says, I delight to do your will, O God. John 1.18 gives us another glimpse into this eternal state before time. It says that the Son was in the bosom of the Father, denoting the most intimate of relationships. It was as if Jesus Christ lay back in his Father's lap and they communed together. Commentator 
John Milne says this. He says of John 1.18, quote, It is as if God has reached into his very being and plucked out his own heart in sending his son. Think about that. This is what God has done to redeem people and to bring them into his family. Notice verse 4. It, it, it highlights something else about what God has done to redeem you. It says that he sent this son from the eternal abode to be born of a woman. And number two, to be born under the law. It's talking about Christ's incarnation. Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law. Matthew 5, 17. I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill the law. Jesus Christ, while he was on the earth, lived the life that you were supposed to live. Died the death you were supposed to die. Died under the wrath of God. He did this for you and I. And he did this for people who don't know him. If you do not know Christ, behold the love of God here in this passage. He loved you enough to die for you. And here we have the two natures of Christ. We have the two natures of Christ in one person. The Jesus Christ is 100% God, 100% man, without mixture or confusion. On the cross, Jesus Christ hung there that you might be made sons. The infinite wrath of God, the infinite measure of your sin, past, present, and future, the infinite worth of Christ because of his deity, all met, spoke, reconciled, and now your debt has been paid. Do you realize what God has done for you? This is amazing. God has redeemed you. What does it mean to be redeemed? It means to buy one back from a slave market. You know, in the ancient times, before someone could be, before a slave could be a son, he had to first be redeemed. See, we were slaves of the law, slaves of Satan, slaves of sin. And God sent his son to redeem us, to buy us back, that we might be made sons of God. Listen, you must remind yourself of this often enough. Often. You must remind yourself of this. Once again, let me take the illustration of the stay-at-home mom. I'm not picking on stay-at-home moms, okay? It's a good thing to be a stay-at-home mom. Watch over your kids, teach your kids. But let's say that mom's at home and, I mean, the kids are acting like Rosemary's baby. I mean, all of them. They're just going crazy. Their heads are spinning. They're just going crazy. And you're pulling your hair and you, you know, you're, and you just can't help it anymore. You just start to yell, you know? What happens? You, you, you start to condemn yourself. Your conscience starts to bother you. you Satan starts to mess with you. What do you do? You have to lean upon this great truth of what Christ has done upon the cross. This truth that you are a son of God, not by works, not by what you have done, but by what Christ has done for you on the cross. And your conscience will be soothed. Satan will run away from you. He will flee. So you must remind yourself of this great truth. Once again, this is something that the Galatian church have forgotten. And this is why they slipped into the law being a means of justification. Lastly, let's look at the fruit of adoption. The fruit of adoption found in Galatians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. Let's read that together. It says, and and because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. I want you to notice the benefits here of 
being brought into the family of God, being adopted by God. Notice here, number one, he talks about us being sons. Now, Jesus Christ purchased for us the legal position of son, of a son. Jesus Christ makes us sons legally, and the Holy Spirit, this is why I said at the beginning that adoption and regeneration are closely related, but they're not the same. Jesus Christ purchases for us sonship. The Holy Spirit comes, and He makes us sons by experience. This word son here in the Greek is a Greek word weos, and it speaks towards the nature of a son. You see, the sons of God, you are changed on the inside to reflect the character of God. Not in perfections, not about about perfection, it's about the direction of your life. It says in Galatians 5, it tells us what the sons of God look like. It says that they love, says that they have joy, says that they're kind, says that they're people of peace. Do you reflect these characteristics? Because when God works to bring you into his family, he changes you on the inside by the power of his spirit. Secondly, the second benefit that God gives to those in whom he adopts is the Holy Spirit. He gives us the spirit. He places him into our hearts to lead us, to teach us the truth, to purify us from indwelling sin. He leads us. Now, when I say that, I don't want you to get all of these ideas in your head. Oh, oh, I'm I'm led by the Spirit. You know, other day, Holy Spirit spoke to me, Demetrius. You know, told me to go west, young man. No, I'm not talking about that. Or the Holy Spirit's given me this gift, Demetrius. I have the gift of, of discerning of spirits. You know, the other night, saw dead people. Listen, if you're doing that, I, don't do that. Just, just stop. I'm, you know, okay? I'm going, I, I, as a matter of fact, if you come to me, I'm going to run from you. And I'm going to tell you that there's someone more qualified like Raymond and Robert to deal with your situation. But that's not what I'm talking about. When you get home, read this, okay? Read Romans 8, especially verse 13, 14, 15, and 16. You have to take it all together. Can't take one verse out and just make a doctrine out of it, okay? Got to take it all together. It says that we are led by the Spirit of God by way of being made free from sin. And that is how He leads His people. Not that you saw dead people, but that You are led into a life of freedom. The Holy Spirit does this in the lives of believers. And this is a second benefit. Number three, notice he talks about our relationship. It's found here in verse six. It says, and because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. This denotes that we have a changed relationship with God. We went from hating God to loving God. You know, a father protects, a father provides, a a father guides. This is what God has become to us. He hears our cry. You know, a couple of weeks ago, my wife and I, we went to the beach. There were hundreds of people at that beach. And I, I mean, I really don't like being around a whole lot of people. That's just a little secret I'll let you know. But, you know, I, I love you all. But I was tons of people. And I was already antsy. And then the umbrella that we had sort of flew away, hit somebody in the face. So I was agitated. I, and I hear this piercing cry. Daddy! Daddy! And out of hundreds of people talking, out of hundreds of people swimming, out of hundreds of people playing and throwing the frisbee, I knew that was Aiden. And he ran, and he's running, and he comes, and he just plops down in my lap, and he says, Daddy, that wave tried to get me. (laughs) I don't know what he thought I was going to do about it. I mean, I... (laughs) You know, 
But this, you see, the Bible says that God's ears are open to your cry. We can't have this idea of God like he's some kind of tyrant in heaven that's like, okay, ready to crush somebody. That's not God. He's open to your cry. This is what Paul is saying. You cry, Abba, Father, to him. And he is there to meet your need. He is there to provide comfort when you are hurting. Look here, another benefit is that you are no longer slaves. Right here in verse 7 says, you are no longer slaves. And Paul is relating that back to the law. You're no longer a slave to works as a means of being just with God. Why? Because it is God who is at work in you to will and do in you of his good pleasure. That's in Philippians 2, 12 through 13. This is what God does. He releases you from this slavery, this bondage. And he says here, look at the last benefit, that you are an heir through God. You know, on this side of eternity, we don't have all of our rights and privileges, our benefits. There's going to be a time in which you can see God in all of his glory. That you can see Jesus Christ, that you could sit down and actually touch him and speak to him. I long for that day, man. I don't know how it's going to happen. Millions of people are going to want to talk to Christ. But I, if, I'm the, if you see a guy butt in line or push you out of the way in heaven, that's probably me because I want to talk to Christ. People often say, hey, I want to go to heaven. want to see John Calvin. want to see Martin Luther. want to see my grandmother. want to see streets paved with gold. I want to see a pearl gate. That's nonsense. When John went to heaven in Revelation chapter 4, he wasn't focused upon streets of gold. He didn't focus upon that. He didn't focus upon gates or angels or Abraham. There are books out there where people have written, hey, I went to heaven, talked to Abraham, rode around in God's car and God's chariot, went to the river of life, took a swim in it, drank of it, played around in the river with Jesus. That's nonsense. Paul went to heaven and it was so glorious that he couldn't even write about it. And when John went to heaven, the first thing he saw, he said, I saw a throne in heaven and I saw he who was seated upon the throne in all of his glory. And that's what you will be enamored with in heaven throughout all of eternity because a street of gold cannot keep your attention, nor a gate. It is the one who has died for you that will keep you, that will enamor you, that will show forth the riches of his grace to you throughout all eternity. I don't know if you are here this morning and you do not know Christ. He stands with open arms. He has paid the price for your sin. We have broken his law time and time again, but he paid the penalty for you breaking the law. And he now, Romans 4.25, has been resurrected and he is seated in heaven. And because he is there, he is the token, he has become the token of your justification. And I bid you to come this morning to him. God went for broke by sending his son to die for you. Why would you wait any longer? Come to him. And he will receive you into his family as his son. Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. I thank you for another opportunity to preach your word, to share the truth of the gospel to your people. Lord, and I pray that you stamp its eternal truths upon their hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.